Good morning, and welcome back to you all after the long and beautiful holiday weekend here in Washington. I'm Suzanne Maloney. I'm Deputy Director of the Foreign Policy Program here at the Brookings Institution. And I'm very pleased to be here to help launch an important new report by two of my Brookings colleagues, Senior Fellow Robert Einhorn and non-resident Senior Fellow Richard Nephew. The report that you have before you entitled The Iran Nuclear Deal, Prelude to Proliferation in the Middle East? Question mark. From their long service as part of the administration, particularly in the negotiations with the Iranians, Bob and Richard know this issue inside and out, and they have crafted a detailed and thoughtful examination of the deal and its implications for non-proliferation policies across the broader Middle East. I urge you all to read the report. You should have received a copy on your way in or on your way out, and study the recommendations, because I think we're all going to be uh, looking at this issue for quite a bit of time in the future. It's been nearly a year since the deal itself was signed, and we've had now almost six months of full implementation of its most important provisions. And yet the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and the Obama administration's diplomacy toward Iran and the broader region has continued to provoke an intense debate here in Washington and intense diplomatic challenges with our allies and across the Middle East. For that reason, we are especially pleased to have with us today two discussants who will take on various aspects of the report. Derek Chalet, senior counselor at the German Marshall Fund, who comes to the German Marshall Fund after a very distinguished career in the administration at the Pentagon, the White House, and at the State Department. And His Excellency Yusuf al ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to Washington, who brings uh, one of the most thoughtful and well-informed voices from the region on this particular issue and has been a, a notable commentary. On, on all of the aspects of the Iranian nuclear deal. You have their bios before you. We're going to start with presentations by the authors of the report itself, and then we'll engage in a discussion from the podium. We'll bring it finally to the audience and give you all a chance to contribute and ask questions to everyone on the panel. With that, let me turn it over to Bob Einhorn. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne, uh, thank you very much, and welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, during the congressional uh, debate uh, on the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, last summer, uh, a key issue uh, in that debate um, was uh, whether the deal would increase or decrease prospects for proliferation in the Middle East. Uh, supporters of the deal uh, argued that by removing the risk of a nuclear-armed Iran, uh, the deal would reduce incentives uh, for countries in the region to acquire uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, opponents, however, claim that the deal would increase those incentives because it would legitimize Iran's enrichment program. Uh, it would allow Iran to ramp up uh, its uh, fissile material production capabilities when key restrictions expire after 10 and 15 years, and it would boost Iran's uh, economy. Sanctions re relief would boost Iran's econ economy and give Iran uh, the resources to devote uh, to a nuclear weapons program. Uh, Richard Nephew and I uh, strongly uh, believe uh, that the JCPOA uh, will reduce prospects for proliferation in the Middle East, but uncertainties about the future of the JCPOA and uncertainties about the future of the region uh, are going to uh, persist uh, for quite some time. Uh, and these uncertainties could motivate regional countries to keep their nuclear weapons options open. And the countries of the region may be asking themselves a number of questions over the next several years. Will the JCPOA be sustainable over time? Uh, will it unravel over questions of compliance? Uh, will it withstand challenges uh, from opponents, both in Washington and in Tehran? Will it survive leadership transitions uh, in the United States and Iran? Uh, will Iran ramp up 
fissile material production capacities when key restrictions expire? Will it then break out of the JCPOA and uh, build nuclear weapons? Will Iran continue to threaten the security of its neighbors? And will the United States maintain a strong regional military presence and be seen by its partners as a reliable guarantor of their security? With the support of the MacArthur Foundation, the Plowshares Fund, and the Carnegie Corporation, uh, Richard and I studied how these and other questions might affect nuclear decision making uh, in key countries of the Middle East. In particular, we evaluated the likelihood that key states will pursue nuclear weapons or at least enrichment or reprocessing <coughs> programs that could give them a latent nuclear weapons capability. We examined official statements, media accounts, and the writings of American and regional experts. We visited the region twice and conducted an extensive series of interviews with senior officials and non-governmental experts to encourage candor. Uh, these interviews were carried out on a not-for-attribution basis. We focused on four key countries, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt, and Turkey. And of the four, Saudi Arabia uh, is the most highly motivated to pursue nuclear weapons. It, uh, Turkey sees Iran as an implacable foe that is intent on destabilizing its neighbors, achieving regional hegemony, and upending the kingdom's internal political order. At the same time, the Saudis have lost much confidence in the United States, commitment to the security of its regional partners. In part as a result, the Saudi leadership has taken a more assertive, independent role in regional conflicts, especially in waging uh, its uh, aggressive campaign in Yemen. But despite these reservations about the United States, the Saudis know that they have no real choice uh, but to rely heavily on Washington for their security. And they know that they would place that vital relationship in jeopardy if they were to pursue nuclear weapons. The Saudis clearly have the financial resources to pursue nuclear weapons, but acquiring the necessary human and physical infrastructure to pursue an indigenous nuclear program would take many years. Richard and I tried to get to the bottom of the widespread belief that Pakistan has agreed to help Saudi Arabia acquire nuclear weapons. But the truth about this alleged Saudi-Pakistani understanding is hard to pin down. If such a Saudi-Pakistani under understanding was ever reached, uh, it was probably very long ago uh, at the very uh, uh, sen most senior uh, levels of both countries, and it was probably very vague, uh, with no uh, operational detail about how it would be implemented or the circumstances uh, in which it would be implemented. And in today's circumstances, uh, it's very unlikely uh, that Pakistan uh, would agree to become uh, Iran's, new I'm sorry, to become uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, nuclear accomplice. We next look at, looked at the United Arab Emirates. Like Saudi Arabia, the UAE believes Iran poses a severe threat, and like the Saudis, the Emiratis have lost considerable confidence in the reliability of the United States. But also like the Saudis, the Emiratis are reluctant to put their vital security ties uh, to the United States in jeopardy. Also, the Emiratis are heavily invested uh, in an, a very ambitious nuclear energy program with the construction of four uh, nuclear power reactors. And the Emiratis know that this program would be dead in the water if they opted for nuclear weapons. Indeed, in support of its strong 
national commitment uh, to the nonproliferation of nuclear weapons, the UAE has formally renounced the acquisition of enrichment or reprocessing capabilities. After the JCPOA permitted Iran uh, to retain its enrichment program, the Emiratis said they may reconsider their formal renunciation of enrichment. Uh, but Richard and I were told in Abu Dhabi that the UAE has not changed its nuclear energy plans and has no intention to pursue enrichment or reprocessing. Uh, next was Egypt. Uh, Egypt is on everyone's short list of potential <laughs> nuclear aspirants, in part uh, because of its former role as leader of the Arab world and its flirtation with nuclear weapons in the Nasser years. Uh, but while Egypt and Iran have often been regional rivals, Egypt does not view Iran as a direct military threat. Egypt's main concerns today include extremist activities in the Sinai, the fragmentation of Iraq and Syria, disarray in Libya, and the adverse impact of these developments on uh, Egypt's internal security. And the Egyptians recognize that none of these threats can be satisfactorily addressed by the possession of nuclear weapons. In addition, while Egypt plans to uh, build its first nuclear power reactor with Russia's help, it had ambitious nuclear energy plans in the past, which never materialized. And given the severe economic challenges currently facing the Egyptian government, Cairo's nuclear energy plans are unlikely to fare much better this time around. Finally, Turkey. Turkey is also on everyone's short list of potential nuclear armed states. But Turkey has maintained reasonably good relations with Tehran, uh, even during the height of the sanctions campaign against Iran. Although the two countries take opposing sides in the Syrian civil war, Turkey, like Egypt, does not regard Iran as a direct military threat. Indeed, Ankara sees instability and terrorism emanating from the Syrian conflict as its main security concerns. And nuclear weapons are not viewed as relevant to dealing with those concerns. Current tensions with Russia over Turkey's shootdown of a Russian fighter jet are another source of concern to Ankara. But the best means of addressing that concern is to rely on the security guarantee Turkey enjoys as a member of NATO. And Ankara uh, will not want to put its relationship with NATO at risk by pursuing nuclear weapons. For the sake of completeness, uh, Richard and I also looked at regional countries whose past nuclear weapons programs were halted by coercive means, namely Iraq, Libya, and Syria. We concluded that under current circumstances, none, none of these countries was in a position to pursue a sustained, disciplined nuclear weapons effort. So our bottom line uh, is that none of the Middle East countries we studied is likely to pursue nuclear weapons uh, or even latent nuclear weapons capabilities, at least for the foreseeable future. Richard. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here. As Bob laid out, our assessment is that the likelihood of a proliferation cascade in the Middle East is fairly low, and it's certainly lower than it was prior to the conclusion of the JCPOA, which addressed in a very direct and fundamental way Iran's nuclear program and the risks that it would contribute to regional proliferation. However, the likelihood is not zero. And if we've learned nothing else since 2000, it's that we should be uh, in possession of a healthy sense of humility about making predictions about the future trend and future direction of events in the Middle East. There are several events that could happen that could invalidate our prediction. 
and much will depend on what Iran does over the course of the next 10 to 15 years. Moreover, even if we're right, there are several things that the United States both can and should do that would decrease this possibility, and frankly, it will also have positive benefits for U.S. policy and U.S. relationships in the region. And we offered eight specific recommendations, each of which has sub-elements. They are, first, to ensure that the JCPOA is rigorously monitored, strictly enforced, and faithfully implemented. Second, strengthen U.S. intelligence collection on Iranian proliferation-related activities and intelligence sharing with countries in the region. Third, deter a future Iranian decision to produce nuclear weapons, including through the passage of a standing authorization to use military force if Iran were to be detected engaging in a nuclear weapons breakout. Fourth, seek to incorporate key monitoring and verification provisions of the JCPOA into routine International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards as applied elsewhere in the Middle East and in the glo global nonproliferation regime. Fifth, pursue U.S. civil nuclear cooperation with Middle East governments on terms that are realistic and which serve U.S. nonproliferation and regional interests. Sixth, promote regional arrangements that restrain fuel cycle developments and build confidence in the peaceful uses of regional nuclear energy programs. S seventh, strengthen security assurances to U.S. partners in the Middle East. And eighth, to promote a stable regional security environment. Now, I won't go into all of these recommendations here, but we do, I do want to stress three common themes that kind of persist throughout all of them. The first is that the central test of nonproliferation in the Middle East will be on whether or not the JCPOA does what it sets out to do, whether it's able to constrain Iran's nuclear program as well as constrains Iran's ability to establish regional hegemony. This may seem like an obvious point, but it cannot be stressed enough that the decision to pursue nuclear weapons capabilities at the end of the day is always going to come back to an issue of security dilemma and a sense of vulnerability. And so an inability to address that invulnerability through conventional means will almost certainly prompt at least consideration of nuclear weapons or at least latent nuclear weapons options by countries. The history of nuclear proliferation, in my view, is in fact one of tit-for-tat armament in the face of overriding security imperatives. And both finished and aborted nuclear weapons programs bear the hallmarks of this security dilemma. And that's no less true in the Middle East. To the extent that the overall security environment can be stabilized, then there will be less of an impetus to develop nuclear weapons or the option to pursue nuclear weapons by all states in the region, both countries outside of Iran and Iran itself. And it's for this reason that we emphasize the full implementation of the JCPOA, creation of this strong sense of deterrence, the establishment of security assurances, especially through mechanisms necessary for them to be seen as both existing and operational, not just simply words on a piece of paper, but something that actually is living and breathing and works on a day-to-day -day basis, and work to promote a more stable regional environment, especially by seeking resolution of simmering conflicts. But these latter two factors also point to another resonant theme in our research, the need for the United States to be a player in the region. In my view, after decades of involvement in the region, we've yet really to settle upon an equilibrium for how the United States ought to operate in the region. And establishing this equilibrium, the choice between involvement and remoteness, is essential. States in the region need to have some sense of predictability when they are dealing with Washington. They need to have a sense of whether or not we are in it for the long haul and whether or not we will fulfill the obligations that we take on. In part for this reason, we've recommended not only deeper security relationships, but also civil nuclear cooperation with interested states throughout the region. Of course, such a relationship is not simply going to be about establishing a closer link between the United States and partners in the region. There is also a value about discouraging the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technology. Doing so may, in fact, require something different than the use of the gold standard as enshrined in the UAE-US Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, at least insofar as the words on the page are concerned. But the practical impact and the meaning of those words has to be the same in order to create this, again, this sense of equilibrium and the sense of, of fairness, really, in how U.S. nuclear cooperation operates. We've also emphasized this imperative of closer intelligence sharing on both sides so that countries in the region know what we know and we're in a position to know what they know and, most importantly, what they think they know. 
And this is a critical distinction. And our ability to be able to work with one another to both dispel rumors that may be contributing to a sense of security uh, concern that isn't even there, as well as to confirm the reality of any suspicions that, in fact, exist. The reality is, however, that only time will tell. And even more important than how the JCPOA was negotiated and what its words say will be how we transition from its restrictions and transparency mechanism into a new world in 10 to 15 years. And this, I think, is the third theme of our recommendations. To put it bluntly, I think Bob and I believe that we should avoid this transition altogether to the extent that we can. The potentially easiest lift in this regard, but I must stress it is not easy by any stretch of the imagination, would be to try and incorporate into standard international monitoring and transparency practices those very tools that we work so hard to put into the JCPOA. Some of these are just technical changes on the part of the IAEA and how it operates. For instance, the use of online enrichment monitoring in uh, uranium enrichment facilities. Other parts, however, may require agreements at the IAEA and even beyond on how nuclear-related activities, particularly those that have some nexus with weaponization, are going to be dealt with in the future. But it's work that must be started now, and it's work that's going to take a long time to complete. A far more difficult lift would be the organization of a regional approach to the nuclear fuel cycle. And I'm not suggesting that we seek to establish a multinational fuel cycle in which Iran and countries in the uh, Gulf Arab side of the uh, Persian Gulf are able to work together on nuclear projects. I think that's probably something that's not terribly uh, feasible. Instead, we recommend that we find ways of crafting regional agreements, or failing that at least regional moratoria, on aspects of the fuel cycle that others in the region would find threatening. Reprocessing is an easy one, because really no one outside of Israel is suspected of even engaging in these activities throughout the Middle East. Enrichment would be altogether more difficult. But I think that there is a relationship that can be built between countries and Iran about holding fast on the kinds of restrictions that are already in place. For Iran, this would involve the actual possession of enrichment, but not in a materially useful way for nuclear weapons pursuits, and Iran agreeing to hold back the development of its enrichment capabilities. For countries in the region, it would involve holding off on enrichment and accepting a at least theoretical asymmetry with Iran, but also avoiding the financial, political, and security investment that would have to be embarked upon and accepted if, in fact, countries were to decide to try and match Iranian capabilities in 10 to 15 years. Frankly, all of this may prove to be impossible to work out. But I believe that a multivariable approach, picking up various different aspects of these recommendations and bringing them forward, has the greatest chance of success and reinforcing what we already think is a positive direction for nonproliferation in the Middle East. And I think it's our view the recommendations we put forward are an agenda of ambitions that ought to be developed further and considered by countries in the region, the United States, and our partners if we wish to actually ensure that the Middle East does not become a cascade of proliferation. Thank you.